chapter 3, forming the second part of our information systems section of the syllabus. Now in chapter 3 we were looking at specific types of information system. The focus here is around how we go about implementing these systems. There are obviously problems, practical problems, in implementing these sorts of IT systems and that's what this chapter is going to consider. As well as that, we're going to look at wider organisational context. Uh, the examiner is very keen on linking different parts of the syllabus together and in fact in, we've seen a previous exam question where the examiner asked you to link IS and IT implementation, i.e. this chapter, with HR policy that you'll be seeing a bit later on. Be seeing a bit later on. However, for this chapter, we're going to be reminding ourselves of the competitive advantage available for those with a superior information system and we'll then consider how information technology can help to deliver a good strategy to help to deliver this competitive advantage. Now we'll be seeing this in context of the Systems Development Lifecycle SDLC. Uh, we're only going to zoom in on the final part of that, the implementation, but that just helps to set us in context. Uh, SDLC is simply a process to follow for designing and delivering projects. But the focus here, as I said, is on implementation. With implementation comes change and with change comes resistance. As human nature uh, suggests, a number of people are very reluctant to face major change, as a result of which when we're implementing a new system we need to recognise and manage that. And finally in this chapter, we'll be looking at what happens after the system has been implemented to make sure that it's maintained and make sure that it retains its value going forward. Section 1. Using IS for competitive advantage. We describe competitive advantage here as a position which is both profitable and sustainable. In other words, something that we can do that our competitors cannot. Uh, lecture example 1 asks us to identify three companies that use IS as a source of competitive advantage. Now, we talked in the previous chapter about Amazon. Uh, Amazon uses uh, information systems in order to develop customer relations. Uh, we saw this idea of the recommendations based on previous buying patterns. In addition, Amazon is able to use information systems in order to manage its inventory, manage deliveries, and therefore stock a huge range of products. Who else could we consider? Well, we could consider Toyota. Toyota uses computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing in order to add value to its products. And again, uh, looking back in Chapter 3, we talked about computer-aided design. Uh, the information that we're able to gather about a car without physically having to build it. Other examples could include Tesco. Um, Tesco using the EFTPOS, the analysis of customers' data. Uh, there is a story, um, I think it's a bit of an urban myth, but it's a nice illustration of the power of this in information analysis. Uh, the urban myth is that uh, one supermarket started putting beer and nappies in the same aisle. Now initially you'd think this was ludicrous, there seems to be virtually no correlation between sales of one and sales of the other, but in fact it was the analysis of sales that did identify uh, a, a high level of crossover. And of course, if you stop to think about it, the people who are buying nappies for newborns are new parents. Realistically, if the baby is very young, uh, probably going to be the new father. Well, if you're a new father, you're unlikely to be going out much more on a Friday night. Um, you're probably suffering from sleep deprivation, so you probably wouldn't even want to go out. And uh, therefore, you might buy a few beers to have in at home. Uh, the classic uh, method of analysing information for competitive advantage.
Michael Porter, one of the key thinkers in this area of management, proposes three generic strategies for achieving a competitive advantage. The idea here is that competitive advantage doesn't just magically appear as a completed product. You need to recognize what is it that's going to make a difference for your company. And crudely speaking, Porter identifies two methods of competing. The first is cost leadership. In other words, my objective is to provide the cheapest product in the market. People come to me because they know that I am the cheapest. Differentiation, on the other hand, says people come to me for quality. In other words, they expect to pay a little bit more. They don't mind doing that because they know they're getting a superior product. And we could uh, put in, for example, EasyJet or Ryanair as a cost leader versus Virgin or British Airways as a differentiator. Uh, Porter does take this split slightly further by talking about focus. With focus, you're zooming in on one segment of the market. And once again, within that focus, you could choose to focus on either cost or differentiation. So for example, you might have an organic meat producer uh, looking to have a differentiation focus within a small geographic area. Perhaps there's one farm that offers organic meat to the local area. Um, that is a classic differentiation focus. Porter goes further by looking at a value chain. Uh, now we're going to see the value chain much more in Chapter 5. Um, at this stage, all you need to know is that Porter's value chain asks does what I do add value to the customer? And Porter argues if it doesn't add value, we simply shouldn't be doing it. Warden Griffiths, on the other hand, uh, suggest four ways in which information systems could be used for competitive advantage. So what could this system do that will help me? They could link the organization to customers or suppliers. Uh, we've talked about Amazon linking to customers. We could also talk about Amazon linking to suppliers. Obviously, they can't have a warehouse with every single item of stock that they offer on their website. There simply wouldn't be space. It wouldn't be economic. So one of the things they do is have a very strong relationship, automated relationship, with a number of publishers and suppliers. They can also uh, generate a competitive advantage by using the information. I gave you the example earlier of beer and nappies being combined in the same supermarket aisle, identifying a buying opportunity and add-on sale that people otherwise wouldn't have spotted. IS can also be used to develop new products. We can use this both from a computer-aided design point of view to actually design the product, but also from a market research point of view. When you're launching a new product or service, you'll be very interested to get as much information as you can about what products and services are available, what market you could be catering for. And finally, and this is really a, a sort of an all-purpose section here, it allows senior management information to develop and implement its strategy. In other words, in the phraseology of Chapter 3, it's an executive information system. Section 2. Aligning systems with business strategy. We recognize that information systems can add value to an organization. The question here is, how does that fit in to the business's overall strategy? In order to answer that, we need to understand the nature of competition within the industry. Now, Porter's five forces that are illustrated in the diagram here are absolutely key to your ongoing studies. We're going to cover it relatively briefly at this stage, um, but it is a theme that will re-emerge again and again through your senior studies.
The gist of it is that Porter says that there are five external forces putting pressure on an organisation. And if we're going to decide a strategy, we need to understand the extent to which those pressures are causing us issues. So Porter says the first pressure is the threat of new entrants. How easy would it be for somebody else to step into the market and trade as I'm trading? We sometimes refer to barriers to entry. The things that might or might not stop somebody else entering the industry. We also have to consider the bargaining power of suppliers and customers. Now obviously one person's supplier is another person's customer. But the idea here is the extent to which your supplier or customer can exert pressure on you. So you could think about for example Royal Mail. Uh, Royal Mail has a virtual monopoly on mail delivery services and therefore could argue as a supplier of this service is relatively strong. The threats, the pressure exerted on it by its buyers is relatively low. If you want to post a letter, there aren't really many alternatives to the Royal Mail. If, on the other hand, you're thinking about milk suppliers, farmers uh, providing milk to supermarkets, you could argue that as suppliers, they're in a relatively weak position. There are lots of um, farms providing milk, only a very small number of supermarkets. By definition, this milk is perishable, so the farms have to sell it relatively quickly. In other words, as a supplier, they are relatively weak. A supermarket isn't going to lose much sleep about pressure exerted on them by milk suppliers. Another pressure that the organisation needs to consider is what are its competitors and rivals doing? Are there many competitors out there? And if so, how are they acting? Is this a very aggressive um, rivalry area? We saw a few years ago with Virgin and Sky uh, having a pretty uh, acrimonious battle uh, which was turning into a, pretty much a smear campaign with uh, one side telling everybody why you know, theirs was better than somebody else's. And finally, we consider substitute products or services. Now it's very important to emphasize here a substitute is not a competitor. A competitor is somebody who provides the same product or service. A substitute is another product or service that meets the same need. So for example we could say that Coca-Cola and Pepsi are competitors. They both produce sweetened fizzy drinks using a similar process to uh, quench people's thirsts. They are competitors. On the other hand, you could say that Coca-Cola and coffee are substitutes for each other. They both quench thirst, but they are manufactured in entirely different processes. Section 3, an introduction to systems implementation. Now before we talk about implementation in detail, we need to see this as the final stage of an overall development process. Now the Systems Development Life Cycle, or SDLC, is a very widely used structure in order to deliver projects. And for, in this context, we could be talking about delivering an information systems project. We start off with planning. What do we need to do and is it feasible to do it? Having got some plans together, we then analyse the situation in much more detail to determine exactly what the requirements are. We design a solution, in the case of information systems, this is actually um, designing the uh, software, what's the, how the software is going to look. The development is the creation of this software, the writing of the software. Implementation then fits in at the very end. When the system has been written, it is now going to be installed and users are going to start using it. 
Now you might be forgiven for looking at this thinking that's uh, all pretty self-explanatory. Well, it is. However, we know from experience that a lot of organizations get so caught up in the project itself that, uh, we, that they often lose sight of these stages. Um, I'm going to put a reference in here to uh, the NHS National Programme for IT. the National Programme for IT. Uh, this is a project that was designed to automate patients' records. Um, it very quickly became apparent that uh, this task was absolutely huge. And in fact, uh, one supplier did actually come out and say, in fact, when we tendered for this, uh, we, we never thought it was possible. In other words, they hadn't considered the feasibility. Um, the costs of this uh, escalated dramatically. The original estimate was a £2 billion project. Uh, as at the last figures, nearly £20 billion had been spent and the project had still not been finished. Now, it's very easy to poke fun at the NHS on this, uh, but all I'm demonstrating here is something that every organisation faces to a greater or lesser extent. The, uh, the issue, reason it's so much bigger here is because, of course, the NHS is a much larger organisation, so everything they do is on a, a much larger scale. Lecture example two is an opportunity for us to consider how the systems development life cycle could help us in our project management. So the requirement says BPP is planning to implement a new information system to manage all non-classroom communication with students. What problems might be experienced at each stage of the development process? Right, well, let's, uh, let's start off with uh, the planning and feasibility stage. Well, one of the problems is that the system is simply unrealistic. Yeah, perhaps we're designing a system that's uh, supposed to, I don't know, put out Twitters to uh, all of our students and put YouTube uh, images up and you know, phone everybody up with automated systems, all of this sort of thing. Uh, and it might simply be this is just not feasible given the access to technology that we have. Following closely behind that, the analysis, um, well, the issue with the analysis is, is what we're going to offer going to add value to the customer? So, theoretically, we could send out a text message to every student the evening before their course starts saying, please don't forget your course tomorrow. The question would be, does that actually add value? Is that going to help BPP meet its strategic objectives? Uh, I would hope that uh, you know, most of our students would be uh, dedicated enough that uh, they, they would be remembering uh, the, 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 the dates of their classroom courses. At the design phase, one of the key problems that we might have here is a lack of user input. After all, if the end users don't find it uh, useful, user friendly, then we're going to have some major problems. So uh, one of the things we need to do is make sure that the users are giving input at this stage. At the development stage, in other words, when the programming is actually uh, created, um, the main uh, thing here is to give clear specifications to the uh, programmers. After all, remember that the programmers are unlikely to be end users. They might not even have any experience of BPP. Uh, so they need, we need to be very, very clear to clarify how uh, this system is going to work, what it needs to do. 
and finally with implementation some of the problems that we might experience is a lack of time if any of the previous product uh, if any of the previous stages slip then it tends to be implementation that suffers because often the launch date is non-negotiable now that's a, a very brief list of the ideas. It's perfectly possible in the exam you could be asked uh, to expand on this for five, maybe even ten marks. So uh, can I suggest that you uh, have a think about some of the other factors uh, that could come in here and uh, you'll be able to see these in the back of your notes. Section 4, Implementation and Review. Having set a bit of context about how we go through the stages of a project, we can now zoom in on the heart of this section of the syllabus, the Implementation and Review perspective. Now you've got a handy mnemonic here, Get Fit for Implementation. We need to consider file conversion, installation, training and documentation and testing. Now the list that you've got in your notes is pretty exhaustive so I'm just going to run through them uh, very briefly but they should be pretty self-explanatory. File conversion. Taking data from one system onto another. Uh, if you go back 10 or 15 years it might have been that you were implementing uh, a new IT system from a paper-based system, in other words manually data inputting it. In reality now uh, it's much more common that this is from one IT system to another. But uh, the principle remains. Uh, stage one, make sure that the original data is correct, back it up or store it, transfer it to the new media, validate it by checking the old versus the new and correct if necessary. That's a very handy uh, five-stage plan to follow. It's very handy to use in the exam if you're asked, how would you go about file conversion? Installation of hardware and software, things that you might need to consider. Selecting the site, a site that is secure, um, that is accessible, uh, that is then prepared. For example, uh, if you've got a server room, you'll need air conditioning and things like that. Planning the office layout. Um, you know where are the I, where, where are the PCs going to be put uh, because there are obviously wiring implications for that and ultimately physically installing the hardware physically bringing it in with all the logistics involved and security issues and installing the software uh, training uh, obviously tra staff need to be trained in this new system uh, methods of training briefings and seminars so uh, um, training um, through uh, explanation seminars, opportunity for people to get together and ask questions. Perhaps a course, uh, you know, a, a more structured approach. This is how you do X. You know, if this is a finance system, for example, go on a course to show you how to process an invoice. And of course, that can increasingly be done on computer-based training, CBT. So that's computer-based training. The alternative is simply on the job training, much more informal, uh, much more flexible, but of course you run the risk of the person training uh, not being a qualified trainer and therefore not necessarily uh, communicating everything that needs to be done. Documentation, uh, all list of the requirements here, the specifications, the user manuals, the operations manuals and procedures. Documentation is very important uh, because without it, uh, there's, if you like, no blueprints to follow if we want to make changes. I was once involved in an IT project where the programmer left having written the program and the, the system itself works. Uh, the problem that we found a few months down the line was when we wanted to make some relatively small changes, uh, because there were no user specifications or uh, technical specifications, nobody actually understood how this system had been set up. It turned out actually to be easier to go right back to the start and uh, write a new system from scratch than it was to try and work out what a previous programmer had done. Finally, uh, testing. 
Uh, testing to make sure that the system is working. Now there are four types of testing, uh, so be ready in the exam if you're asked to discuss these. Uh, make sure you get all four of them down. Realistic testing. We put people through the process that they would normally do. So let's stay with the new finance system. Uh, this would involve, realistically, people sitting down and processing invoices. So, you know, Flossie processes 10 invoices an hour, so we'll get Flossie to sit down and do 10 normal invoices an hour. Contrived testing, on the other hand, tries to see what would happen if something a little bit unusual happened. So maybe uh, you know, if Flossie tried to process an invoice for a million pounds, what would happen? Would the system reject it or accept it? What if Flossie wanted to uh, do a particularly complex form of credit note, one that perhaps isn't normally done? Would the system accept it? So in this case, we're deliberately focusing on the unusual transactions that might only happen once in a blue moon. We then move on to volume testing. It's all well and good saying the system can cope with Flossie processing 10 invoices, but what happens if it's month end, if it's really busy and everybody's madly processing data? So we get all of our users to sit down and blitz the system simultaneously to make sure it will stand up to it. And finally, acceptance testing. Acceptance testing makes sure that my users can use it and understand the benefits of it. This uh, acceptance uh, is particularly important because without a user's acceptance, uh, they can uh, certainly cause all sorts of problems for the project to the extent where the new system takes much longer to get up and running. Systems changeover. Once we have a new system that's all ready to go, there are four main ways in which we can transfer from an old system to a new one. The first is the direct changeover. And what happens here is simply we turn the old system off and turn the new one on. Now this is commonly used where the system is not critical to the business. So for example, if you were installing a new drinks machine at work, uh, you would probably turn off the old one, turn on the new one. Um, if it didn't work, it's not the end of the world. But interestingly, the direct changeover can also be used in potentially high-risk situations when we cannot afford to have more than one source of data running simultaneously. So, for example, if you are an air traffic controller, the last thing you want are two systems running side by side. One is telling you the plane's at 30,000 feet, the other is telling you the plane is at 3 feet. Um, what you need is a direct changeover, however, that the risk would be mitigated through intensive testing in advance. The second option is parallel running. Here the old and the new system operate together. The great thing here is that you can compare the outputs, make sure the new system is fully up and running and reliable before you turn the old one off. The disadvantage here is with data processing. If you're running two systems, that means that you need to process all of your data twice during the transition period. Effectively, if you're, for example, processing invoices, then you could be talking about doubling your workload on your staff. Now C and D, pilot running and phase running, uh, this is when we implement our system stage by stage. Now, um, the difference between pilot and phased running is with a pilot there is no obligation to complete. So no obligation to complete. If you think about a pilot for a television program, what do you do? You make one episode of a program, and then people will make a decision. Do we commission the rest of the episodes, or do we pull the plug? And it might be that the pilot never, uh, ne ne never emerges into a full series. With phased running, on the other hand, although we start off with one part, one um, section, 
going live first. The difference here is that we are already committed to completing this rollout. The only question is when and how it is done. Now the advantage with both pilot and phase running is that it allows people to learn as they go along. So for example within the pilot uh, we could talk about um, a restricted pilot uh, running one set of data on the new system first. So instead of going live with a whole new finance system, let's just try it with the sales ledger. Or let's just try it with the purchase ledger. Let's uh, just see what happens with this. Uh, and that way we can focus our resources and our efforts on getting that bit right before moving on to the next one. Uh, this can be done on a geographic basis as well. So we do perhaps the whole system in one office and then the whole system in another office and so on and so on. Now lecture example three looks at three scenarios and asks you to recommend a changeover method and explain why. So, uh, in a minute I'd like you to press pause and select from the four options above which of them will be most suitable for London Ambulance Service, for an accounting package and for a credit card system. So, our first uh, requirement, London Ambulance Service, introducing a new vehicle scheduling system. Well, this is a very similar idea to the air traffic control that we were talking about earlier on. Therefore, the recommendation is one of a direct changeover. We don't want any confusion about where the ambulances are, about which system is live and which system isn't live. We must know exactly what is going on. However, we would qualify this with intensive testing in advance. Now, XY Limited, upgrading Pegasus accounting uh, package from DOS to Windows in each of its 10 offices. Well, for these, I would suggest either a pilot or a phased implementation. And we do this one office at a time. So we'd go live in one office, see how it goes, learn from our mistakes, and then move on to the others. And finally, NatWest credit card services system issuing statements to all to customers with all transactions recorded. Uh, this system would best be implemented using parallel running. The reason is you'll note that the credit card transactions have already been recorded. So we're not going to re-key those transactions. What we're going to do is we're going to use two different systems to generate the statements. So with a relatively small amount of work, we could run that data through two different systems. It's a really good way of making sure that the data is accurate and reliable. Um, we can obviously reconcile one to the other. Section 5. Information Technology and Change Management. As we've already established, the end users are very important in implementing a new system. If they're not uh, properly trained or properly motivated, the system is not going to work. So in order to understand this, uh, Torrington and Waitman look at four types of change and the reaction from members of staff. 